Okay, let's talk about some of the characteristics of vac vascular plants, some of the parts of the plant, and the ways that plants grow. Primary growth with meristems and secondary growth. So plants' bodies are organized similar to animal bodies, as we will see, starting with cells. And here is a typical plant cell with a large central vacuole. This is a colorized scanning electron microscope image. Here's the nucleus. We can see chloroplasts here. And they're all pushed up against the side because of this large water-filled central vacuole here. And then there's a cell wall with cellulose in it. And we can see a neighboring cell, some bits of neighboring cells over here. Those cells, there's a few different types of cells found in plants, and we'll talk about some of those. The cells are organized into tissues. A tissue has multiple cells of a similar type that perform some function, and organs are specific parts of a plant, like a leaf or a root that performs a specific function, and organs have several different tissue types in them, as we'll see. So the basic parts of a plant are the roots, stems, and leaves, which you probably knew that just from everyday knowledge before taking uh, this class. And they have different functions. The root, the function of the roots is to take up water and minerals from the soil. The purpose of the leaves is, to, is two things. One is to allow sunlight to strike the chloroplast for photosynthesis, and the other is to allow carbon dioxide to be taken into the leaves, which is uh, what's going to be turned into sugars and fats and proteins by the plant, is the carbon in that carbon dioxide. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about these different parts and what tissues are in those. So here's our basic plant here. Uh, and of course, we're talking about vascular plants. If you remember the non-vascular plants that we talked about don't have true roots or leaves, and they don't have this vascular tissue. So we're talking about vascular plants here. So uh, leaves are made up of two parts, the blade and the petiole, which is the sort of the stem of the leaf. Um, Plants have shoots, and that's what's above ground, and roots, and that's what's below ground. A flower is just a reproductive shoot. Um, the growing parts of plants are buds. Uh, and we'll talk about in more detail what's in all of these parts. And vascular tissue goes throughout. So roots have several functions. One is just to anchor the plant, and even non-vascular plants have underground structures to help anchor them. We just don't call them roots. Uh, they absorb water and minerals, and they also store carbohydrates. And this is an important function. Some roots are highly specialized to store carbohydrates that we call tubers. Um, most of this surface area of, an, of a water absorbing root is from is root hairs and you can see them nicely on this little radish seedling here. You can see all these little hairs that vastly increases the surface area for water absorption. And most plants, over 80% of plants, form symbiotic relationships with fungi, which we call mycorrhizal associations. Myco is for fungus, rhizal is for root, so fungus root associations. Uh, some roots are specialized, some are specialized for uh, lateral support of the plant, and we see this on a lot of large tropical plants. Some plants also have uh, above ground roots that strangle the other plants that they're holding on to, like strangler figs. Um, some plants, especially ones that live in very poor, acidic, swampy kind of soils, have these, uh, the trees have these knees that we think are for gas exchange, but it's not uh, completely certain. Um, and some, like potatoes, radishes, carrots, are especially adapted to store carbohydrates. Um, a stem is a connection between the roots 
and the leaves. And the stem is made up of nodes and internodes. The nodes are where new branches or leaves emerge, and internodes are what's in between the nodes. And the primary function of the stem is to increase in length uh, and get the leaves closer to the light and also help orient the leaves for better photosynthesis. Um, stems can also be modified for special functions just like roots can. So some plants have uh, long stems below ground that are mostly for vegetative propagation. If the plant like irises do this, they have underground stems called rhizomes and the roots emerge from these underground stems. And this can be a way for the, I'm sorry, that is my dog. Stop that. There's a chipmunk outside. Uh, and that can be a way for the plant to reproduce vegetatively or non-sexually. Um, the same with runners or stolen. Uh, these are, I'm just going to call them runners. And this is, again, another way for plants to reproduce asexually. And all of the, this is a strawberry plant here, all the little new strawberry plants growing from these runners are all going to be identical genetic clones of the parent plant. But again, these are modified stems. Um, modified uh, uh, stems can also be uh, for storage of carbohydrates, as in onions, uh, which we'll see. Um, leaves are the major photosynthetic organ, although there are plants that have photosynthetic stems and even photosynthetic roots like orchids. So uh, the purpose of the leaf is to allow gases to exchange, and we'll see how that happens. Also, they can be for dissipating heat. And you might wonder, how could leaves defend plants against herbivores? Well, that would be by producing toxins in the leaves that would deter herbivores or having spines or other physical deterrents. Um, sometimes the leaves completely become spines, like on cactuses. Uh, monocots and eudicots have different vein arrangements in the leaves. And as if you remember from chapter 30, uh, monocots and eudicots are most of the plants. And then we have these other more primitive plants, which used to be considered dicots, but aren't anymore, like the magnolias and uh, water lilies. Those are uh, like, they look mostly like dicots, but now we know that they're, they don't belong with the rest of the dicots. So now we have eudicots and monocots. So here's an orchid, they're monocots, and we can see the parallel veins in the leaves, and this would be the same. Other monocots would be grasses like corn or wheat or your ordinary grass uh, in your yard are also monocots. And eudicots are uh, all the other things. So uh, this is a, um, a fiddle fig, which is a popular house plant at the moment, but it has nice branching veins in the leaves and things like oak and maple and those strawberry plants that I was just showing you, those are all eudicots. So leaves can evolve to be specialized as well. So the little tendrils on a pea plant that help them attach to a trellis or really any anything. Uh, those are modified leaves. Spines on cactuses are mostly modified leaves. Some succulents have uh, little leaves that actually can break off or drop off and will root and form a completely new plant. Um, the uh, onion is actually another modified stem with leaves. So the stem is actually way down at the bottom of the onion where the roots are. And all of these uh, layers of the onion are leaves, modified leaves. So the tissues of the plant, we break them into three general categories. Uh, and these are dermal, which are generally things on the surface of the leaves or the stems and the roots. Vascular, which are for transporting water and minerals and sugar generally around the plant 
and then the ground tissues. And these are the, the, the rest of the tissue. If it's not vascular tissue and it's not on the outside of the leaf or the stem or the root, then it's a ground tissue. So the dermal tissue system, this is uh, generally the epidermis. This is the outermost layer of cells. And the epidermis uh, excretes a waxy coating called the cuticle. And for land plants, this was a really important adaptation. Green algae don't have this. They do not have a, a cuticle layer, which is a, um, a waxy uh, substance that prevents water loss. And on some plants, it's much thicker than others. So plants that are adapted to living in a more dry climate will have a thicker cuticle to help prevent water loss. And we'll talk about some of the adaptations as well. Uh, some additional adaptations in the next chapter that also prevent um, water loss in some of these plants. So, uh, and then we'll also talk about some of the other reproductive structures. So on the outside of a leaf or a stem, these specialized uh, epidermal cells called guard cells help gas exchange. There are also hair-like spikes. This is a scanning electron microscope image, and you can see the little individual cells here. This is a, a quite high magnification. It's colorized. So uh, these little hair-like trichomes can help reduce water loss and defend against predators. Um, and these are the reason that some leaves, leaves are um, quite furry feeling is because of these. Um, the vascular tissue transports water from the roots up to the rest of the plant and minerals. Plants get their minerals through their roots as well. And uh, sugar is manufactured in the leaves during photosynthesis. And that then is transported down to the roots because, of course, the roots don't photosynthesize. And there are two different types of vascular system uh, that transport these because, of course, they're going in different directions. Um, the water is generally going up from the roots to the leaves, and the sugary solution is going down from the leaves to the roots. So it's two separate systems in vascular plants. The xylem is transporting from the roots to the leaves, mostly water and some minerals. And the phloem is transporting sugary solutions and amino acids and a few other things from the leaves mostly to the other structures of the plant that are not photosynthetic. So the tissues that are not vascular or dermal, that's the ground tissue. And the ground tissue in the leaves is specialized for photosynthesis. And in other places, it's specialized just for support. Um, there are rigid cells in plants that whose only function in the ground tissue system is to make the plant more rigid and provide support for the general plant structure. Um, this is a cross section of a leaf here, and we can see the different tissue types here. So uh, the, epider the epidermis here is this outermost layer of cells, and right on the very surface you can see this yellowish waxy layer. Uh, of the cuticle layer and the same thing on the other side of the leaf here. Here's our vascular tissue, this nice bundle right here. And there's just some vascular tissue here too that's kind of cut in a weird section. And then we have the ground tissue is all the stuff in between here. And uh, this is called the mesophyll. And we have the tissue here that's mostly responsible for photosynthesis, the palisade parenchyma or the palisade mesophyll. And then down here, the spongy mesophyll or the spongy parenchyma. Uh, and these are part of the ground tissue system. And most of the photosynthesis occurs here. And the spongy parenchyma that has all these holes in between. This allows gas exchange for the major photosynthetic part of the leaf up here. So the uh, xylem, which is mostly conducting water, the xylem, the cells that make up the xylem, Lacey, stop that. Uh, the cells that make up the xylem, when they are mature and functioning, those cells are dead. Uh, and lignified. So lignin 
is a molecule that's made only in vascular plants. It's very rigid. It helps the plants maintain their rigidity. It's a major component of wood, uh, and it's part of the xylem. And it's believed to have evolved in vascular plants, lignin, in vascular plants specifically to help them to grow taller and to help support the vascular tissue of the plants. Um, there's two kinds of vessel elements. One of them is called uh, the tracheids, which the tracheids are more like a series of cells that allow water to pass between them. Uh, and then there are the true hollow vessel elements that also allow water to pass between them. And these are these cells are dead. At maturity, and so in a uh, in a tree, the uh, the central wood that those cells in the wood at maturity are dead, and only the cells at the periphery are still living. So here's a close up of what that looks like. So uh, the vessels are, of course, these large openings here, uh, and then the smaller holes are the tracheids, and Again, when these cells are functional and mature, they are dead cells, and what remains is the cell wall uh, and these little plates in between them that allow the water to move in them. And the water moves in them because of uh, water being, uh, because of hydrogen bonding in water. This allows water to stick together in a continuous column. So as water evaporates from the leaves, it draws water up through the xylem in a continuous column. Uh, the phloem is where the sugar is sugary water, because of course sugar can't be transported without being dissolved in water. So the phloem cells are alive at maturity, but they're not very functional. They don't have any chloroplasts. They're uh, uh, they're living cells, but they're not going to divide again. They're terminally differentiated, and they're lacking organelles. Uh, so vascular plants, like the gymnosperms, they have a type of cell called sieve cells. Uh, angiosperms have um, a slightly different kind of cell called sieve tubes, but they function the same way, and uh, they are long connected hollow cells, but they're smaller. The, um, the phloem uh, uh, conductive elements are narrower than the xylem. And that's one of the ways we can pick them out when we see them on the microscope. If you see them next to each other, the xylem are, uh, those vessels are larger than the phloem vessels that you'll see. So growth in plants occurs at meristems. And you could think of the meristems as being stem cells, similar to what we're going to talk about in animals, like in the bone marrow. So stem cells uh, in plants, uh, where we find them in the apical meristems and the lateral meristems. So the apical meristems, apical means on the top. So at the tips of the shoots and at the tips of the roots, that's where we'll find cells dividing by mitosis that are going to be increasing the length of the roots and the shoots. Uh, that kind of growth is called primary growth. Growing longer is primary growth. Lateral meristems also have cells dividing by mitosis, but they're adding thickness. And lateral meristems are found in woody plants that are undergoing secondary growth. So in a woody plant, like a young tree sapling, it's both getting longer by primary growth and the stem is getting thicker by secondary growth. And so we'll talk about both of those things. And this, uh, the tissue that's dividing where we find these mitotic cells in the lateral meristems, they're called the vascular cambium. Is one, they're, the vascular cambium is creating new xylem and phloem, and the cork cambium is replacing the epidermis. And these two are close to each other on the outside of a tree stem that's growing. And we'll, you'll see some diagrams of what those look like. So just as an overview, so here's our woody plant here. This could be a tree seedling growing. So we have an apical mer meristem at the 
tip of the shoot and we have apical meristems at the tips of all the roots and we also have lateral meristems inside of the stem that are adding new vascular tissue so inside those lateral meristems grow in both directions we are adding new cells to the xylem towards the center and we're adding new cells to the phloem towards the outside and we're also adding new cells to the epidermis so here's our primary growth here's our apical meristem on the shoot and generally you don't see the apical meristem because it's covered by the new little leaf primordia so it's generally quite protected and you wouldn't see it unless you peeled off those little leaf primordia uh, and so we have a region here of rapidly dividing mitotic cells uh, then we have a phase of cells lengthening and then finally they are fully differentiated further down in the stem um, for the lateral meristems, this is only in woody plants. So annual plants that die every year, that don't ever get larger and larger and larger year after year, like woody plants, they're not going to have this. So we have two regions of rapid cell division, and one is the vascular cambium, and then that's, that's the little red cell here, or the red line here. So the vascular cambium is sending out new cells in both directions. The cells toward the inside of the tree are going to be the new xylem, and cells toward the outside are going to be the new phloem. So that is growing outwards like this. And the new inner xylem cells here, that's going to be the heartwood of the tree. And so as the tree grows, this vascular cambium is slowly moving outward so if here's this is our tree the vascular cambium is moving out as that tree grows and what's left in the middle the heartwood is the dead xylem from previous year's growth and that's where we find the tree rings this outer region that's going to be the bark of the tree this is the living bark of the tree so these cells uh, the xylem cells, remember, are dead at maturity. So the inside of that woody stem ha is composed of dead cells, and the living part keeps moving out as the tree grows. So the bigger our tree, the wider our tree, the further out that vascular cambium is. And then there's another... Uh, place of rapid growth, the cork cambium, and the cork cambium is essentially making bark. Uh, cells are rapidly dividing and they are being pushed outwards and so that is creating the new bark on the tree. So the bark, generally on trees, the bark is being sloughed off uh, a bit every year. Little chunks of the bark will fall off constantly. In some trees it peels off in big sheets that bark is being generated by the cork cambium that's the protection for the tree and then the vascular cambium is generating the wood and that is actually moving outward as the tree grows so here is a woody stem where we can see last year's growth and new growth so we have our nodes and inner nodes where our leaves are growing so where a leaf is growing that's a node and in between those those are inner nodes uh, on a new one-year branch we don't have any secondary growth yet it's growing from the tip but down here we have a uh, second year growth and this branch down here is is getting wider it's getting wider by secondary growth um, flowering plants are classified by whether they um, reproduce and die every year or whether they take two years or more. Um, so these are our annuals. So annuals go to seed every year and die and they don't survive the winter. So things like sunflowers, um, many, many of our plants that we enjoy in our yards every year are annuals. Uh, annuals are not going to come up next year unless they come up from seed and they replant themselves. A lot of our um, 
Uh, food plants are also annuals, like corn uh, is an annual. It will not come up again next year. Uh, farmers have to replant corn every year. Um, many plants are annuals. We often find uh, a lot of annuals in places where the climate is um, not good for most of the year, like in the Arctic areas and in the deserts. You often find a lot of annuals that can go through their whole life cycle and go back to seed in weeks. Biennial, biennials are kind of unusual. There are way more annuals and perennials than biennials. Biennials are kind of the rare weirdos in the flowering plants. They take two growing seasons to go to seed. So their first growing season, they tend to be just a little whirl of leaves um, and they don't do much. And then the second year, they shoot up generally a very large uh, reproductive shoot with lots of flowers and seeds. And this is one that's a local Illinois wildflower. It's actually found all over the Midwest called mullein. And it's quite tall here. This is its second year. So the first year, mullein is often mistaken for lamb's ears. It's a little tiny plant with very soft, uh, furry leaves. It's a, they're very pretty, kind of a light, kind of a bluish green almost because of all the hair on the leaves. Um, kids love to pet the leaves <laughs> when it's a, its first year. Now it's second year though, so then it, it, the leaves die in the winter and it overwinters. And then the next year it looks like this. It shoots up this huge flower stalk that uh, can be five or six feet tall. And it's covered with about a hundred little yellow flowers. Uh, it goes to seed and then it dies. So that's a biennial. Um, then there are perennials. So a perennial means that it's going to survive for many years. It can go to seed every year and not die. And it will come up from the roots. And one of the plants that I brought into lab are tall grass prairie uh, plant. Big blue stem is a perennial. Uh, most grasses are perennials. That's why your, um, well, some grasses are annuals. But the granite grass that we plant in our lawns, like Kentucky bluegrass, it's a perennial because otherwise you're, you'd have to completely replant your lawn every year. It keeps coming up because it's a perennial. Trees are perennials. <laughs> they're there every year. We don't have to keep planting them from seed every year. Um, so perennials, we find perennials in uh, areas that are both dry and wet that have change of seasons and ones that, that don't have, uh, that aren't in a temperate climate. Um, but this is an adaptation for waiting out poor growing season. A plant can survive for many, many years and reproduce many times. Some perennials are adapted to produce more seeds in certain years than others. So if there's a lot of rain, one year, they'll produce a lot more seed. If it's dry, they won't produce as many seeds. So uh, all th we find all three of these native to Illinois, but the biennials everywhere are just more rare. Okay, let's look at primary and secondary growth in a little bit more detail. This photo here should look familiar. Last semester, we looked at allium root tips in one of our uh, labs to look at mitosis, and now we know why we didn't find the dividing cells right at the tip. Instead, we found most of the dividing cells in the apical meristem of the root, and you can actually see in here some nice little mitotic cells here dividing. There's a nice one uh, in metaphase. And so these rapidly dividing cells are then going to elongate once the root tip pushes past them, and then they're going to mature. So we have three zones. We have the zone of cell division. So we have the root cap out here where we don't have a lot of rapidly dividing cells. And then we have our zone of rapidly dividing cells. And then we have a zone, we can't see in this picture, of elongating maturing cells. And then we have a zone of differentiation. So Here's that root cap, and this is not where you find all the rapidly dividing cells. The root apical meristem is where most dividing cells are, and then there's a zone where the cells are simply growing larger and elongating, 
and then they're differentiating. And that's the region where we start to see the root hairs. <clears throat> so the difference between monocot and dicot roots. And you should have been able to see this in lab. We had, uh, there are slides with both a monocot root, which I think was corn, uh, which is the genus Zia. And then we also had buttercup roots, which I think was the ranunculus um, genus. And we can see some differences and some similarities between them. We can tell the xylem from the phloem because just like in the stem, the xylem vessels are large. In the dicot root, they tend to be clustered in the center here in this nice uh, X pattern. And in the monocot root, they are in a ring. Um, the phloem vessels tend to be next to the xylem and they tend to be smaller uh, than the xylem. So that's one of the ways that we can tell the difference between them. And the primary growth of shoots, again, we have an apical meristem just like in the roots. And that rapidly dividing apical meristem, you normally won't see it directly because it's going to be protected by those leaf primordia, like in this image here. So here's our leaf primordia here, which are folded together and covering the apical meristem, which is actually right down inside here. Uh, and we can't, we couldn't see it without peeling those apart. So, and the buds develop from meristematic cells left at the bases of the leaf primordia. So you can see there's actually, you can see a tiny little axillary bud here uh, next to this leaf. So here's a slice through an apical meristem. And, it, and the biggest difference here between a root apical meristem is we don't have that cap of non-mitotic cells like we do on the root. The root cap is to protect those fragile mitotic cells as it extends into the soil, which is uh, quite a rough process. But for the shoot, it's extending into the air. So its only protection is usually the leaf primordia, which eventually uh, move <clears throat> as the leaves grow. And then see here we can see axillary buds. And the apical meristem actually inhibits these axillary buds from growing with a hormone that we'll find out about in a later chapter. And if you cut off the apical meristem, these axillary buds are going to be uninhibited then and they are disinhibited and they will start to grow much more rapidly. If you hear a bell ringing, that's my dog ringing the bell again to go out uh, because she's once again seen a chipmunk outside. So uh, axillary buds are ready to go, but they are being inhibited by the apical bud. And we call that apical dominance. And this is something that's well known in uh, gardening. If you're, this is a basil plant here. If you want those little side branches to grow and you want your plants to become bushier and have more branches and more leaves, you have to get rid of that apical meristem by cutting off the tips of the plants. And that works with tomatoes and it works with basil. And then it releases those axillary buds from their inhibitory hormone that's being produced by the apical meristem. Uh, so <clears throat> here we have the stems again between dicots and monocots and they look a bit different. Uh, monocots, the vascular bundles are more scattered and within each vascular bundle we have xylem and phloem and again you can tell those apart because the xylem tends to be the xylem uh, tends to be larger than the phloem vessel elements. <clears throat> In a dicot stem uh, we have a large central pith area that's supportive tissue. Uh, you see the, uh, the um, ground tissue that's called sclerenchyma. This root means hard. So sclerus, something that's sclerus in medical terminology as well, is something that's hard or rigid. So the sclerenchyma are supportive cells. They generally uh, have a lot of lignin in their cell walls, and they help the plant maintain its shape. And then we have phloem and xylem. And again, you can see the xylem vessels are larger and the epidermis on the outside of the stem 
uh, as well. Uh, leaves grow from leaf primordia um, that have their own uh, uh, specific characteristics and leaves also have holes in them to allow gas exchange and these are called stomata so singular is stoma and plural is stomata and these can open and close and as we'll see in the um, next chapter when we start talking more about photosynthesis uh, we'll talk about how this is an adaptation for conserving water because when the stomata are open not only is carbon dioxide and oxygen being exchanged, oxygen is being released, carbon dioxide is being taken in, but water can also escape. Water vapor can escape. So being able to close the stomata during the hottest part of the day is an adaptation that plants have that live in drier areas. Um, but this is still better than not having any cuticle at all. Uh, these are, the stomata are holes in the cuticle that can open and allow gas exchange much more easily because the cuticle layer on the outside of the epidermis pretty much doesn't allow any gas exchange and very little water to evaporate across the cuticle. So here's the structure of a leaf. And again, we can see that palisade mesophyll and the spongy mesophyll, most of the photosynthesis is going to occur in the palisade mesophyll. We have our outer layer of cells, the epidermis, and outside of that is the waxy cuticle that's secreted by the cells of the epidermis. Um, this is a microscope slide section of the same kind of thing. We can see a vascular bundle here and these long mesophyll cells that are packed with chloroplasts uh, inside of them. And this is a nice image of the surface of a leaf where you can see those nice stomata with their guard cells that are living cells and it is the guard cells that allow the stomata to open and close to cons mostly they're closing to conserve water um, plants can close the stomata when water when uh, water uh, is short in the plant uh, or for desert plants they just close them during the day all the time to conserve water so secondary growth is only for woody plants. There are hardly any monocots that have secondary growth. Um, the exception would be the very large tree-like monocots like palm trees, which are the only monocot trees. Uh, and they would have secondary growth. But in generally, when we say secondary growth in woody plants, we're talking about eudicots. Um, and some magnolias as well, and some of those other primitive, previously thought to be dicots, <laughs> also have secondary woody growth. Um, so gymnosperms and angiosperms also have, uh, both have secondary growth, uh, but it's rare, it's rare in monocots, like I said, that we're talking about the few monocots that are large um, perennial trees. So the secondary growth occurs in the stems and usually not really anywhere else. Um, maybe the roots, um, but not usually anywhere else. So the secondary growth, this is, this is the growing laterally. So remember primary growth is getting longer. Primary growth is the tips of the roots and the shoots. Secondary growth is in that vascular cambium and the cork cambium. So we have two places in uh, the outer edge of a woody stem where we have growth. And the vascular cambium is growing in both directions. So we can see this here, that's the little pink line here, and you see that it's growing in both directions. So, uh, and that means there's mitotic cells there. There's cells dividing in the vascular cambium. And as those cells divide, they become either new phloem or new xylem. And the new xylem cells, once they form their tracheids and vessels, die, and they're dead at maturity. The cells in the phloem, however, are, once they're terminally differentiated, they're not going to divide again, but they're still technically alive. And then we have the um, cork cambium that is generating the bark layer. So the cork cambium only has growth in one direction, outwards, and it's... Uh, uh, cells are dividing and 
pushing out the bark of the tree. They're generating the bark of the tree. And then the uh, vascular cambrium is generating the wood. And this is actually the living part of the tree is this outer layer. So in a very large tree that let's say a tree that's 50 years old, the entire center of that trunk is just dead xylem. It has a lot of lignin in it and so it's very rigid. And then the only living part of that trunk is the outer edge where we have the vascular cambium and the cork cambium that's growing. So here, and this is how we get tree rings as well. So in areas that have seasons, in the temperate regions, that's what temperate regions means, that we have winter and summer. So early on in the spring, uh, the type of xylem that forms, it forms very large vessels. That's the early wood. So if we look at our little slice here through this three or four year old tree here, the early part of the tree ring um, is lighter in color because it's large vessels that are going to carry more water up from the roots to the leaves. And then late in the season, late summer and fall, uh, the vessels that form from the vascular cambium are going to be smaller. And so that's why we get this dark to light, dark to light, dark to light that allows us to count the tree rings and determine the approximate age of the tree. And now the bark is going to continue to slough off. The phloem here uh, is very important for transporting nutrients down to the rest of the tree from the leaves because remember phloem is going down and the xylem is water going up and the cork cambium is just generating that outer, outer protective layer the cork cambium is producing the bark of the tree uh, and it varies quite a bit uh, tree barks are can be extremely odd and in fact the cork in a wine bottle or any kind of a bottle that has a real cork is from a specific kind of oak tree, the cork oak, and they happen to generate extremely thick bark that can be harvested off the trees without killing the tree because they're only taking off this outer layer. They're not killing the cork cambium uh, when they remove the outer layer um, of cork. So, uh, and most of them are from Spain and a few other countries. So that's how we get tree rings. Tree rings are generated because of the activity of the vascular cambium and the fact that the, the type of vessels that are generated varies during the year. Now, if it's a very, very dry year, the entire tree ring will be smaller. If it's a very wet year, the tree ring will be wider. So that's another way that we can tell whether it was a good year or a bad year, in addition to just counting the rings, we can see how thin or thick the tree rings are. Um, and, and in fact, this is really important to historians as well as biologists because they can often correlate uh, societal disasters that occur with droughts by looking at tree rings of the right age from uh, fossilized trees if it was really long ago or just uh, dead trees so it that it's really interesting um, way that we can find out about the history of climate in a very specific region especially for rainfall uh, by looking at the tree rings and how wide they are so here's two little tree ring samples here if uh, it was a very dry year. The tree rings will be very small because not much activity in the uh, vascular cambium. And if it's a very wet year, get very large tree rings. Um, so very interesting how we can get that. Um, and this is the these are the oldest known trees, the bristlecone pine trees, which are found in the American Southwest in Colorado and Arizona and New Mexico. They can live at very high elevations and their secret is that they are extremely slow growing. So they don't need much from year to year. So they can survive. Uh, I think the oldest ones found were several thousand years old. Um, I can't remember exactly how old, but over 2000 years old. 
So very interesting. Um, okay, so uh, that's the end of the parts of the plant. And you'll notice that I left out some things from the chapter, and that was intentional. So there's a lot more vocabulary in the chapter than I included. So um, if I didn't talk about it, you don't have to worry about it for the test.